Hello ladies. Um, we are going to do some thermochemical equations. While I'm out, uh, it can be a way for you to practice and get through just about the rest of the uh, packet. So kind of looking at page seven, so you should know how to do you know the specific heat, heat stuff by now. But let's just take a peek at the bottom of page seven where it says thermochemical equations. Um, we're going to look at doing a little bit of uh, mole conversion stoichiometry type work with uh, the idea of heat energy. So, let's just take a peek at that one. It says when one mole of calcium oxide reacts with one mole of water, one mole of calcium hydroxide forms and 65.2 kilojoules of heat is released. So let's express this with uh, the equation. Calcium oxide, calcium has a plus two, oxygen has a minus two, reacts with water, produces calcium hydroxide, and 65.2 kilojoules of heat energy is released. So we're going to put that in the products because released energy is exothermic, means it ends up in the products, okay? And so just double check that we've balanced this correctly. Uh, if you have troubles with water, you can always write it as HOH, okay? So if you take a peek at that, you've got two oxygens, two hydrogens, two oxygens, two hydrogens. So it is one mole of each of the reactants produces one mole of products. It's already balanced. So let's just, I'm going to make something up here just so that you guys can see how we would do these equations. So let's say I react 50 grams of calcium oxide with excess water. Okay, you know what that means by now. Excess water means there's plenty of water. Let's just figure out how much energy is released when 50 grams of calcium oxide is reacted. So I'm going to do my normal stoichiometry equations. Go to mole. And because, oops, because we have a one to one to one ratio, um, we know that we can just put one mole of calcium oxide releases 65.2 kilojoules of energy. If it was a different coefficient, I would put that coefficient at the bottom. So I just have to get the mass of calcium oxide. Oxygen is 16. So let's add that up. And calcium's uh, molar mass, if you look at your periodic tables, is 40.078, so 16 roughly plus 40 is about 56. I'm going to be a little bit more specific there. Now you can see I have a little bit less than a mole. So if I have a little bit less than a mole that's reacting, I should have a little bit less than 65.2 kilojoules of energy. So I'm just going to do this how I've done any other ones. Multiply anything that's in the numerator, divide by anything that's in the denominator. And you should get a total of 58.13 kilojoules of energy is released. Uh, when uh, 50 grams of calcium oxide is reacted with excess water. Okay, let's try another problem. Number two, let's just do number two on page seven. And then I'll show you how we're going to apply this. So you have two sodium bicarbonates absorbing 129 kilojoules of energy to produce, basically we did this not that long ago, sodium carbonate, water, and carbon dioxide. 
Okay. And it says calculate the amount of heat required to decompose 2.24 moles. So we have a little bit more than 2 moles of sodium bicarbonate. We're going to decompose it. I know for every 2 moles of sodium bicarbonate, I need to absorb 129 kilojoules of energy in order to decompose it. I have to absorb that energy. What am I absorbing that energy for? I hope at this point you can say breaking bonds, right? In this case, when I'm absorbing energy and I have an endothermic reaction, it's because I need to break those bonds and there's really just so many bonds that have to be broken compared to the ones that are formed. So you take 2.24 times 129 divided by 2. What do you get? So you get 144.5 kilojoules of energy is absorbed. Okay, or if you wanted to talk your delta H as a positive, 144.5. Oops, you can't see because of the picture. Five, positive 144.5 kilojoules, okay? Keep in mind if this had been an exothermic reaction and I wanted to write it as a delta H, I would write that delta H as negative because the system is losing energy. So you, again, the endothermic and exothermic isn't changing from what we talked about last week. Endothermics have a positive delta H because they have to absorb energy to break more bonds than they're forming. And like in the previous reaction, when energy is released, and I go back up here, right? If I wrote that as a delta H, exothermic reactions are losing energy, so I want to make sure that I don't lose track of any of the previous stuff that we talked about last week, okay? All right, so what are we going to use this for? This is pretty much what we did. You're just going to treat the energy amounts and the coefficients just like you did mole ratios uh, in the previous unit. But what we're going to use it for is looking at states of matter, phase changes. So if you turn to page 9 in your packet, you'll see a funny looking diagram. So ultimately what we're trying to he understand here is that there's a certain amount of energy that's needed to change states of matter. And so we're going to use a combination of our specific heat calculations as well as our thermochemical equations to figure out an overall amount of energy to change state of matter of a substance. So we just did some thermochemical equations with chemical reactions, but we can use a similar idea here with um, amount of a substance changing state and doing a physical change, okay? So we're going to practice that here. Okay, so let's just look at example one. You'll notice in example one it's saying 13 grams of ice has a temperature of negative 5. So we know that a couple things we have to put in our brain is that 0 degrees Celsius is the freezing point and melting point of water. So obviously if I'm getting colder or removing heat, it's freezing. If I'm adding heat in and you know putting absorbing heat into that ice, I can go from solid to liquid. So you have to keep those kinds of things in mind here. Um, so we're starting off as a temperature of negative 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then we're going to a temperature of 24.5 degrees Celsius. Now, what you have to understand is if you hit a point at which you're changing states of matter, so like for water, it's zero degrees Celsius for the freezing point, melting point, or 100 degrees Celsius for uh, the boiling point, or if you're condensing, you have to keep that in mind. If you're crossing that, there's a couple of things that we're gonna talk about here to, to be aware of. So first off, um, you want to kind of chunk it. Where are we, what are we doing in this physical change? Well, from negative 5 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, I'm adding heat. Okay, so this means that I'm absorbing heat into that ice cube. So you can think about this ice cube basically very, very cold at negative 5. We're going to add heat in to get that ice cube 
to zero degrees Celsius. Now, how much heat? Well, that's where we know Q equals MC delta T. Q is the amount of heat that we're gonna put in. M is the mass. We said this was a 13 gram ice cube. Specific heat, I can look up the specific heat of water, but you gotta be careful because you're looking up the specific heat of water in this case uh, that is from being solid. So just know that some substances, depending if it's a solid, liquid, or gas, will be uh, different. Okay. All right. And then the delta T, uh, the delta T is going to be the change in temperature. So T final is zero degrees Celsius minus T initial, which is a negative degree, five degrees Celsius. Okay. So you can just put in those uh, values, and so you have to look up the specific heat of water at as a solid. And what you should get would be 2.05, and remember that's joules per gram degree, gram degree Celsius. This over gram degree Celsius. Okay, so take that, find that. 13 times 2.05 times positive 5, you get 133 joules roughly of energy absorbed into that ice cube to get it from negative 5 to 0. Okay, now what happens is you have that solid ice that you want to turn from zero degrees Celsius solid to liquid at zero degrees Celsius. There's a state of matter change. We're gonna do a phase change gizmo um, on Monday, Tuesday time frame to explain why you still have to add energy in in order to get water to go from a solid to a liquid. But that's where that chart comes in handy. And you'll see that for water, in order to go through the delta H of fusion, okay, you need to absorb, so fusion is from a solid to a liquid, you need to absorb 6,010 kilojoules, or sorry, joules per mole of energy, okay? So you're gonna have to find how many moles of ice we have here. So we have 13 grams of ice, which is water, and we know using the molar mass. And feel free to slow down this video and pause it um, to help you figure this out. 18 grams per mole is the molar mass, so 13 divided by 18 gives me 0 0.722 moles of water. And now I know that in order to change the state of matter, if it was a mole, it'd be 6,010. So I can just do like my little thermochemical calculation here. Mole of water is 6,010 joules of energy. All right, so for the, to get that point, 722, we get 4,340 joules of energy. That's a lot of energy just to change the state of matter. We didn't even change temperature. Now I need to take that liquid water at zero degrees Celsius and go to 24.5 degrees Celsius. A temperature change here means that I can use that equation Q equals MC delta T. Notice that the C for this case is gonna be 4.184 because we're talking water that's a liquid, not a solid. So if you put that 13 grams in, and the delta T, T final, 24.5 minus T initial, which is zero, you get a positive 24.5. That amount of energy to change that water from a liquid uh, to, a, or keep it from a liquid to a liquid, is 1,332.6 joules. Okay. Now what we do is we add up all those joules, and that tells me the total energy that it took to get that water from a solid ice cube at negative five to a liquid ice. And what you should get for your final value 
is 5,805.6 joules of energy.